Hey, what's going on? This is the Body Punch Podcast, and my name is Naz. What an amazing night of fights. We saw a bunch of knockouts. We saw a bunch of technical wins. We saw some really capable fighters. It was a great way to show the new fans that came because this was a Conor McGregor fight. We saw a lot of new fans. We saw a lot of new people talking about this. All of these fighters to come out and put on the performances that they did under the big lights, under all of the camera, everybody's watching. Everybody's watching this card. And for these athletes to perform the way that they did was amazing, was great. And Dustin Poirier coming out and defeating Conor McGregor in the second round by TKO is flat out spectacular. It's amazing. We've never seen anybody do that to Conor McGregor. We haven't seen the greatest boxer in the world knock out. Conor McGregor like that. We didn't see that in the Floyd fight. We haven't seen that in any of Conor McGregor's fights. This is something that puts you in the history books. Dustin Poirier was talking about this in the lead up to this fight. That he's about to be in the pages of the history books. He's about to be in there with the greatest of all time. You know, to be one of the greatest of all time. To be in the Hall of Fame, which I already think he is in the Hall of Fame, in my opinion. But this, the way that he executed this and came out with the amazing game plan that he did just gives him a page in that book. The book of the greatest of all time. Man, I, I watching this fight, it makes me really want that one to be for the belt. I think this Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor card, or this fight right here, should have been for the belt. And then right before that, we saw Michael Chandler make his debut in the UFC and win by a spectacular knockout. Having that classic Henry Hoof style. He said it himself. They keep it simple down there in South Florida. And for him to just come out with that game plan of going to the body, exposing the head, and knocking him out. That wasn't no accident. That was not an accident at all. That was part of the game plan. Because you have a fighter that was so much taller so much taller than Michael Chandler what other way are you going to go about exposing the head to knock him out and both of these fights were in a lot of people's eyes upsets a lot of people had Dan Hooker winning a lot of people had Conor McGregor winning and for these two fighters to come out no matter what the media said, no matter what anybody said, to still beat their opponents just shows the the guts, the determination, and the well-executed game plans from both of these fighters. Now, let's talk about the Michael Chandler win first. Michael Chandler came in Made his UFC debut. I mean, that's got to be... that The jitters on him must have been un, unfathomable. To have your name up there in Bellator, to be the face of Bellator, to take a chance, move to the UFC at the age that he's at. I think he's like 34. And to 
restart his career almost because in the UFC they don't give you no breaks they don't give any breaks at all they gave him Dan Hooker from the start Dan Hooker was the only one that accepted the fight against a person who hasn't shown anything in the UFC there was no measuring stick for Michael Chandler nobody knew what would happen when he came to the UFC? It's not like he's fought anybody in the UFC at the moment that can kind of give us that measuring stick to show us where he's at in the best organization in the world. Michael Chandler came in here, like I said before, with an amazing game plan and a calmness about him. Michael Chandler, if you watch his fights in Bellator, comes out like in fifth gear right from the start. He comes out and he's ready to go. He's like a motor, like nonstop. In that first round, he's up there as one of the most deadliest. But he came in here calm because Dan Hooker was circling around the cage, circling, trying to find some sort of beat on Michael Chandler. I really think that he thought that his length would pay, play a major advantage, which, you know, a lot of people thought. I thought that as well. But Michael Chandler went in there calm and executed his game plan to expose the head, to hit the body and exposed the head. You could see that Dan Hooker was getting ready because we didn't know if Michael Chandler would come in here and really explore his wrestling pedigree. We know him as a knockout knockout artist in Bellator, but he might have just come in here with a different game plan. He might have just started wrestling him. We didn't know. Like I said, there was no measuring stick. On Michael Chandler. I think there was many things that went into this fight. But this is something that I'm going to talk about in in both of these fights. About both of these fights and the other fights on the card. Is that the time difference. From New Zealand and America. For both of these fighters. I think played a major factor in everybody. It might be a good thing for some fighters. It might be a bad thing for some fighters. But I think it affected everybody differently. I think it affected... I'm I'm not saying Dan Hooker lost because of the time difference. He's been here before. He's done this before. Michael Chandler has been here before for that test flight that he made to Abu Dhabi flight, uh, Fight Island. I'm not saying that the the results were just about the time difference. I'm just saying that some of these fighters don't have to, never dealt with a time change like this. We were listening to different coaches' interviews, and some were saying that they're going to wake up right before the fight starts. Some people were saying that they're going to wake up three, four hours before the fight starts to get warmed up and to get ready for the fight ahead. Dan Hooker was saying, I don't know if he was playing some games or anything like that, but he was saying that he was going to wake up right before the fight and just get at it. But then you got someone like Dustin Poirier who was saying that, yeah, I'm going to wake up three, four hours before the fight and get loosened up. I don't know if that had a difference or if that made a difference. But I also know this, is that Dan Hooker had a lot of things on his mind. You know, he's probably thinking about the month-long quarantine that he has to do after the fight. All of these things are in his mind, but I think one thing that did not help at all is that his head coach was not there. Eugene, who is one of the smartest coaches in the UFC 
was not available to Dan Hooker because he had other obligations. There's no fault of its own. This fight got made really quickly and he had to go and help one of his pro boxing students. But you got to think about it. You got Dan Hooker here on Fight Island who's been here for a couple weeks now without his head coach. They probably talked on the phone. They might have done FaceTime or some video chat. But there's, it's not the same as seeing your fighter in person. That's a big disadvantage, in my opinion, for Dan Hooker because of the camp that he comes from. The same camp that Adesanya is from. Not having Eugene there, I think, might have played into this. Yes, you go over the game plan before you get there. Yes, you talk to the coach or whatever over the phone. But to have someone with you on Fight Island, obviously I've never been there, but I would assume that having someone there to constantly set you back bring you back to center, bring you back to the alignment that you need to be at for this fight, I think is a major, major factor. And one that is needed for these fighters. They go into that cage alone, but they prepare with a giant team around them. And not having his head coach might have played into it. But Michael Chandler did win this fight. All props go to him. The way that he came in there, still calm, but executed his game plan. And the call out that he made was great as well. It really showed everybody who Michael Chandler is. He's a nice guy who has an amazing family, but is still super exciting. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. He said this repeatedly when he got signed to the UFC. That I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. Now, a bunch of people are talking about this tournament that BT Sports has come up with. But they're saying that Michael Chandler should fight Justin Gaethje. Now, that would be a really fun fight. And I think that is that might be the right fight to make for the circumstances that we're in. Like I said before, I think that Dustin Poirier deserves to have the belt right now. I think he needs the belt right now. And I think Michael Chandler still needs to fight another contender. You might be able to put him up against Dustin Poirier because it's a fresh new matchup for Dustin. He already beat Gaethje and he's seen everybody else in the division. We'll we'll talk about this later, but the activity level of Dustin Poirier is spectacular and the people that he's fought before is amazing. But I think that Michael Chandler could either fight Justin Gaethje, maybe Dustin Poirier for the belt, but it'll be, it'll have to be for the belt. I think Oliveira could also fight Dustin Poirier. I don't think Oliveira and Michael Chandler is the best fight to make. But I think that Justin Gaethje, because Khabib Nurmagomedov seems like he's retired. He wasn't interested by any of the fights. But because he's out of the mix, I think that Michael Chandler should either fight Justin Gaethje or Dustin Poirier. But amazing game plan, amazing way to introduce yourself 
to the biggest organization in the world. I mean, I can't think of anybody else aside from maybe Anderson Silva that made their debut like this. People forget that Anderson Silva had an amazing debut. But the way that Michael Chandler came in, and I was so excited to see Michael Chandler join the UFC. Now, what does it mean for Bellator fighters? And what I mean by that is, are Bellator fighters able to fight in the UFC? I think this is a question that we all knew the answer to. Bellator fighters, it depends on who it is, right? I I still think that the UFC is the greatest organization in the world for mixed martial arts. I don't think there's an argument to be made for that. But there are some Bellator fighters that can come in and do some damage in the UFC. Michael Chandler is the face of Bellator. And he came in and fought Dan Hooker, the number six ranked guy. How does he do with five and up? We'll have to see. But the way that he showed his presence in the UFC was nothing short of spectacular. It was a great way to start off with the co-main event and to go into that Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor fight. Now, let's talk about this. Dustin Poirier comes in, second round TKO finish in at 2 minutes and 34 seconds of Conor McGregor. What happened in this fight? I think what happened in this fight was exactly like I was saying about Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler and his team came in with an amazing game plan. Dustin Poirier came in with, like, it was the best way to fight Conor McGregor. And the thing is, Conor McGregor hasn't fought in a year. You don't know who Conor McGregor is. Is he the featherweight Conor McGregor that he fought before? Is he the same Conor McGregor that he fought at Alvarez? Who is this Conor McGregor? That was the real question. So I think Conor said this himself, that this is the best version of Conor McGregor. This is the best version of himself. He was training hard for this. There's no distractions. Nothing came up. But Dustin Poirier came in with a game plan that was amazing. He did his research. He found out that the only two people that didn't get knocked out in the first round, like some of the most successful people that didn't get knocked out in the first round by Conor McGregor, was Khabib Nurmagomedov, and Chad Mendes. And what do they do? And who are they? They're wrestlers. He wrestled Conor McGregor. Even though it wasn't, there wasn't much advance, there wasn't much happening, Conor McGregor really had to work to get to the side of the octagon, climb up the cage, and then get out of that grappling exchange. I mean, that takes a lot of energy. And especially when you got a guy like Dustin Poirier, who some believe is not going to be fighting in 155 for too much longer. He's going to go up to 170. He's a big boy. To have someone like that try to grapple you to the ground and get out of that, that's a tough task. I mean, Dustin Poirier came in and did the wrestling. The first round, he did get clipped by Conor McGregor. He admitted him himself. He said that Conor McGregor hit him with the left hand. It flashed him. Sparked him a little. And the thing is, is that he said himself, and I don't know how to make, like what to make of this, 
But he said if Conor McGregor hit him a couple more times, he thinks that the fight would have been done or it would have been it would have been really tough to get out of that situation. It was a tough situation, but I don't think Conor McGregor read it properly. I think his experience which has been very fragmented throughout the years. It didn't give the give him that instinct, that killer instinct that he always has. Because he was such an active fighter. Before he had that instinct. But now I don't think he saw that Dustin Poirier was out of it. I think that at the moment he was tr- really trying to conserve his energy. He wanted to show the world that Conor McGregor has a gas tank and he's here to stay. He's not someone that, c- that you can weather the storm in the first round and then later on he's tired. He, he wanted to show everybody that that's not the Conor McGregor That's not the new Conor McGregor. Now, what happened in the second round? Throughout the first, on top of the wrestling, we saw these calf kicks, these lower calf kicks. In the second round, we saw a lot more of those. And then at the time, DC also mentioned it himself, saying that Conor McGregor's leg looks truly messed up. It looked it looked bad. And this is a new development in MMA. This low calf kick. You know, leg kicks have always been in MMA. But this low calf kick, this new school technique is something that Conor McGregor never had to de- deal with. This is something that Connor really felt the effects of this fight being Southpaw versus Southpaw. Connor's leg was really exposed. And he was turning his leg a bit. He was lifting it, but the effects were still happening. His leg was going numb. And at one point, it looked like Connor was leaning against the cage. To regain his balance. And that was the only way he was standing up. And this is a position that we've never seen Conor McGregor in. We've seen him exhausted. We've seen him get choked out. But we've never seen him stumble against the cage. And then at that point, Dustin Poirier put on this avalanche of punches. And there's no way that you can survive a barrage like that from Dustin Poirier. When he turns on in that moment, when he smells blood, when he sees you in a compromised position, the way that he saw Conor McGregor, it's over. And then we saw that punch. Herb Dean called the fight. And Conor McGregor was laying on the ground. I think that the legs kick, leg kicks like Connor alluded to was the beginning and the end of the fight. That was the one thing that Connor's never seen, and this is due to the inactivity. But we can't forget how much Dustin Poirier has evolved as a fighter. Chael Sonnen brought this up. But Dustin Poirier always had the skills. He's always been so active, been in that octagon for so long. And he's seen so many different kinds of fighters. He keeps on learning. He's always had the skills. He's been fighting for so long. These guys are the exact same age. You know, Dustin just had his uh, birthday. But these guys are the exact same age. 
it seems like Dustin Poirier has so much more experience inside the octagon. You know, this might be due to Conor McGregor being such a mega superstar that the UFC is trying to save him, save face, and do all that kind of stuff. But Dustin Poirier has just been in there for so long. He's seen so much. He's seen the evolution of the game. And then when he saw how effective the calf kick was against himself, he started implementing it into his game. And the way that he used it, the way that shot affects fighters, your leg totally goes numb. Connor was saying that from the hip down, it was completely numb. So I think this is due to inactivity on Connor's point. You know, Connor said that inactivity had to play into this. But we still got to remember Dustin Poirier's game plan. So you can come up with all the game plans that you want. You know, he's got the smartest crew out there in Florida at ATT. But when you got a fighter that's capable like Dustin Poirier to execute the game plans that they come up with, then you have a special fighter. Then you have a special fighter. And that's the evolution that we've seen of Dustin Poirier. The evolution of a fighter that just went in there with emotions like the first fight against Conor McGregor. And now we have this fighter that's coming in and saying that before he even walked out, he wasn't even nervous. He had no emotions about it. He came in and did business. You know, I think that Conor McGregor not talking or anything like that might have played into it. No emotions involved. You know, Connor talked about this at the end. And I think this was a note that was that was really important. But he thought maybe the way that he acted in this fight might have, um, you know, that might be the reason because of the results. He wasn't really, he was complimentary to Dustin Poirier. He didn't really go after him at all. He didn't go after him one bit. But he thinks that that might be the reason Dustin Poirier won. He might act different. But then he kind of retracted. He came back. He said, I'm just going to act the way I want to act no matter what. But he also, he brought it up. He thinks that him being so complimentary of Dustin Poirier might have something to do with it. But who knows? Now, I think this is a great fight for Dustin Poirier. All hats off. I I think this, this makes him the champ. Like I said before, he is the champion now of the 155 pound division. Khabib Nurmagomedov said himself via Dana White that nobody interested him. I think he really wanted that Conor McGregor fight. And when he didn't get it because he lost, he said, okay, I'm really done now. I just want to spend time with my family. It's over. I got businesses. I, I'm doing all this kind of stuff. Like he was handing out sports drinks and energy bars and all that kind of stuff during the week. So I don't think Khabib Nurmagomedov is interested in fighting any of these fighters. He's not going to fight Michael Chandler. He's not going to fight Dustin Poirier, who he already beat. He also came out and tweeted that this is what happens when you change camps. This is what happens when you change camps and fight with other people. And you don't fight with the people that brought you to the championship level. He's referring to Conor McGregor, obviously. What do I think about that? I think that, you know, there there might be a bunch of different factors. I don't think Conor has severed any of his ties with his old training partners. I think this is all due to the coronavirus. There's nothing that can be done. 
You know, some of his teammates are not even in Ireland. They can't even make it to Portugal. The coronavirus thing is something that's overlooked, but it's affecting all of us. It's funny. But I think that has to do with it. I think that the coronavirus thing, that might be the factor. That might be the reason why Conor McGregor had to fight with some of his old boxing coaches, fighters. You know, he was training with a bunch of boxers for this fight. So, I mean, we can't forget that the coronavirus is happening. So what do I think is next for Conor McGregor? I mean, Conor's got to regroup. Some people are saying that the Nate Diaz fight is the right fight for him to finish off that trilogy. Some people are saying that the Dustin Poirier fight, I think Conor wants the Dustin Poirier fight again. To run it back like that, it might be a little difficult. Because of how dominant it looked. You know, for some people that don't even watch UFC or MMA, and for them to turn on the TV or glance on Twitter that Dustin Poirier defeated Conor McGregor, they might be like, okay, this Conor McGregor guy, like, he's not that good. I was about to say sucks, but he doesn't. He's one of the greatest. But for a casual fan, for the person that just... Does, that doesn't watch every single time. It might seem like Conor McGregor is not up to par. Well, and Conor McGregor also mentioned that styles make fights and inactivity is is a big factor in this fight. I think that, yes, I agree styles make fights. You know, obviously I agree to that. That's, you know styles make fights it just happens right like some people get exposed by jiu-jitsu fighters some people get exposed by strikers but in this fight i think it was something different i think that inactivity might have something to do with it but it the fact is is that dustin poirier has been in there for so much longer than conor mcgregor with high level fighters In his discipline, he's not going off to fight Floyd Mayweather. He's not going up in weight to fight Nate Diaz. He's sticking to 155. And at one point, he was sticking to 145 and then made the move to 155. Staying there and fighting the best of the best. Like, if you just look at his past fights, you can't find one pick. Like, it's all pickums. He didn't go in there the favorite against anybody. So what do I think is next for Dustin Poirier? I think Dustin Poirier should have the belt now. I think he is the greatest 155er on earth right now if Khabib Nurmagomedov is retired. Dustin Poirier just showed the world that he deserves the belt. And the UFC can still just give him the belt. I mean, it's their organization. They can be like, hey, man, sorry about that. Here's the belt. That's just something that the UFC can do right now. But for the next fight, I think that he's got to fight Oliveira, like he said. And, I mean, he could fight Oliveira, and then Connor could fight Gaethje. I know I said that Michael Chandler could fight Gaethje before. But it just depends on... You know what what happens? We got to see the we got to see a, a play out. We got to see one or two fights confirmed before we can give confirmation on all the other ones. But I think that the the Gaethje Connor fight would be a good fight to have. Dustin be both of those guys. It might be a good way to get Connor back into the mix. Fight a brand new person, a person that likes to stand up has wrestling but never uses it, has really amazing wrestling but never uses it in in Justin Gaethje. But I think Dustin Poirier deserves the belt right now and he should fight Oliveira or if they really want to run it back for the belt with Conor McGregor. But it was just so one-sided. It's just, it's tough for me to say. This 155-pound division is the best of the best. It's a shark tank. It's a shark tank. It, It was crazy. 
So Conor McGregor also said that this is not his retirement. He's not going to retire just because of this fight. He will be back in 2021. And he'll fight again with consistency to get time in the cage. Even when Conor McGregor heard the bell for the first round, in his head, he said to himself, this is great. I got more time in the cage. He didn't think of it like, oh, I didn't knock him out in the first round, this or that. Or he didn't, you know, have his uh, prediction go through of him knocking out Dustin Poirier in the first 60 seconds. He didn't think about that. He, interestingly enough, thought, wow, I'm going to make it to the second round and I'm going to get more time in the octagon. What an interesting mindset. Amazing mindset. And with Connor coming back in 2021, we can't say to ourselves that, wow, this is the end of Connor McGregor. You know, what do we do now? Is he going to go fight like Manny Pacquiao or some other fighters? I think Conor McGregor's here to stay. This is the determination. Just like Dana White said in his post fight press conference, this, this is like Rocky. This is when Rocky got all the money and he's got to make a comeback. This might be the thing that wakes up Conor McGregor. But he's got a tough task in front of him with Dustin Poirier. Because I'm going to assume that Khabib is done. Khabib has said it multiple times now that, hey, man, leave me alone. I'm not fighting anymore. So I think Khabib is done. And now all of these guys have to fight this amazing fighter in Dustin Poirier who's coming up with all of this great game planning so I think Conor McGregor also needs to come back with a better game plan he's got to make sure that he's up to date with these new leg kicks uh, calf kicks being outside of the game he's got to I mean he's got to figure out a way to either he was saying changing his stance and doing all that kind of stuff I think that he's just got to be the old Conor McGregor and come out in the first round and be the most devastating fighter in the first round, like he's always been. It's funny because in the pre-fight stuff that I created, you know, I kept on saying that people are worried that Conor McGregor was so nice to Dustin Poirier. But in my mind, I was like, don't worry about that. He was really nice to Donald Cerrone and then knocked him out in, what, like 40 seconds? So... I don't think the being nice or cordial or anything had to do with him not executing his game plan in the first round. It was just something else. I think Connor really wanted to show his gas tank. He really wanted to preserve his energy and show everybody that he is a five round fighter. So, I mean, this, this fight for Dustin Poirier just to end off this podcast, this fight for Dustin Poirier was amazing. His stardom is going to increase, just like we saw with Nate Diaz, in my opinion, when he beat Conor McGregor. And it's only to the top now. This guy should have the belt now. And he's going to do so, so many amazing things with his foundation. Conor McGregor being a good sport. and giving money to Dustin Poirier. Also, one other thing, the way that Conor McGregor, he looked after the fight, it was just really hard. Like, it wasn't hard to see. It was just amazing to see him getting knocked out like that That was spectacular on its own because we've never seen anything like that. And then for him to come up onto the podium and do the post-fight press conference, which he didn't have to do, and to do with class, and for Dustin Poirier to come up there and to do with class and 
it was always fun to watch those because you you hear the game plans that they were trying to execute because now they can kind of talk about it. But Dustin Poirier brought up that I don't know if the nice thing from Conor McGregor was a way to get into Dustin Poirier's mind. He he was thinking that it might be a trick play or something. But both of them had class. This is the way that the sport should be conducted. We were talking about the Khabib Nurmagomedov thing before and Conor McGregor. That was such... It was hard to see. I mean, we're in the fight business. This is not the nice kind of... You're not supposed to be the nicest to people, but to see two competitors come out there and be so classy in defeat and in in the win from both, from all four of these fighters. I know Dan Hooker was a little bit mad. He took off his gloves. We don't know what the situation with him is right now. He left him in the octagon. So we don't know what the situation is. I hope he doesn't retire. This is a guy that needs to be in the sport. I think that if his coach Eugene was with him, coaches don't just give game plan and all that. They they put you back in alignment like I was talking about before. They give you emotional support. They give you all this kind of support throughout the tough fight week with all this media, then you're cutting weight, and then it's a start and stop kind of sport. You hit the pedal to the metal, and then you hit the brakes. There's no, you know, there's no kind of, you know, gliding to the end. So I think that this card was amazing. Let's just talk about some of the other stuff that I saw on this card. Um, Joanne Calderwood looked great. I think that her and Valentina Shevchenko would be a good fight. I mean, Valentina is so advanced. But to see Calderwood win after the whole fiasco of her losing the title fight before, it's great to see that. Um, Amanda Rebos losing, that's a big deal. Um, to Marina, uh, I mean, that was a hype train that kind of got slowed down, but hopefully she comes back. And uh, Marina, I think that she uh, is going to do a lot of amazing things with her Muay Thai skills. I mean, being a Muay Thai fighter like that, she's going to do a lot of amazing things. I think Armin uh, in that light, lightweight bout, Man, he's big for lightweight. Keep on forgetting that the, uh, those two guys were fighting in lightweight. For him to fight a new opponent like that in Matt um, and to dominate with the wrestling and the striking, it his wrestling was so suffocating. And then his striking as well was pinpoint accurate. He's going to be a problem in that division. Brad Tavares with the nice win. Juliana Pena with the submission win in the third round. I mean, that choke, it was kind of like a magic trick if you think about it. It's like, look at my hand over here. Nope, I got you with uh, my right. That was an amazing choke. Great win for uh, Martian against Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree looked great in the fight, in my opinion. But... When you got a guy that's on, um, he I think he's on a three fight skid, and uh, you can't lose four. You're gonna get kicked out of the UFC. So he had a flame lit underneath him, and won that by decision. So that was a great win for him. So overall fun. I mean, when Conor McGregor's in the fight game, it's always fun to watch. And now we have Dustin Poirier as the greatest light lightweight fighter in the UFC who I believe should have the belt right now and he's got all the cards and he's going to call the shots this is a guy that came from his last fight and 
jumped over all the obstacles, doing a lot of great things with his foundation and seeing his business actually grow as well with this hot sauce company. And then seeing Michael Chandler make his amazing debut, like we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast. Great to see all these fights. Amazing upsets. And uh, yeah, the, the stars were bright for the UFC at UFC 257. So thank you for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. If you guys could like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification on YouTube, that'd be amazing. If you guys can get five stars and all that on the different podcast platforms, that really helps a lot. And this has been the Body Punch Podcast. My name is Naz. Bye. Oh,